here at the National Association of Founding Research Foundation. Um, we are excited to be hosting another round of the virtual peer learning network series, which focuses on county level leading innovations and strategies for expanding high quality services for young children from prenatal to age three. We created these networks for counties to have a virtual interactive space to engage with peers on prenatal to three topics. And for today's discussion, uh, we'll be featuring both national and county level experts and focusing on strategies to support home based childcare providers. Um, so these peer learning networks are part of our Counties for Kids initiative. Um, Counties for Kids is a public awareness campaign for county leaders who are committed to making investments in young children from prenatal to age three. Counties for Kids has free online tools and resources. Um, you can see some on the screen here that are available for all counties, uh, no matter where you are in your early childhood journey. So you can find these resources and more at www.countiesforkids.org. Um, and I think my coworker Rashida is gonna put a link in the chat. Um, but I also wanted to share um, a new resource that we have just re recently kicked off um, called the Counties for Kids Neighborhood. Um, and the neighborhood is a, a virtual platform that allows county leaders to ask questions, share best practices and virtually learn from experts and each other. Um, so very similar to these peer learning networks, um, but the idea is that it's a platform you can visit anytime you have a question, um, share, you know, kind of have conversations going with your peers all across the country. Uh, the neighborhood will also be focused exclusively on counties' needs, challenges, and opportunities, uh, and provide a safe space for questions and peer learning. It'll be hosted on the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers Exchange platform, um, and I'll show you just a little bit kind of what the homepage looks like and we'll share out in our follow up email um, the link that you see on the screen and also a more comprehensive guide to help you um, get used to the neighborhood. But essentially, once you visit the link up there, um, it'll ask you to create an account on the exchange if you don't already have one. Um, and then you will create a username and password and request to join the counties for kids neighborhood. Um, from there, you can start a discussion, respond to existing posts, um, share resources and see resources that other members of the neighborhood have shared out. Um, and to get us started, I put a discussion post up there um, about home-based childcare and this week's peer learning networks. Um, so we really encourage you to check out the neighborhood after this call um, or sometime next week. Um, and just continue the, the discussion that we're having today. Uh, you can log on and share you know, your key takeaways, any questions you still have, um, things you wanna highlight that are happening in your county. Um, it's just really an open space designed for you all to connect with your peers and have that space for brainstorming and peer learning. Um, so before I turn it over to our speakers, I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Please note that today's meeting is being recorded uh, and you'll see some reminders on the screen about Zoom, um, just guidance for muting and unmuting, starting and stopping your video and accessing the chat box and raising your hand. Um, and we'll go ahead and test out the chat box now to learn who is joining us today. So if you could all take a minute to just share your name and your county in the chat now. Um, and we ask that for the first half of our session, while our speakers are presenting, you remain muted, um, but we encourage you to continue to use that chat to engage with presenters and with each other. Um, you can ask questions, react, or share your experiences. And then for the second half of our convening, we'll open it up for an engaging and interactive discussion. Um, this will really be a time to learn from each other and share best practices within your county. We want you to be able to engage with our speakers and with each other. Um, so we encourage you to keep your video on, particularly when you're speaking. And you can use the chat to share ideas and questions, um, but we suggest unmuting and sharing your question aloud with the group um, so that we can all kind of hear it and address it. Um, throughout the discussion, you can use the raise hand function to indicate you'd like to share. Um, we have a pretty small group today, so you can also probably just unmute yourself directly and start speaking. Um, and if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, um, you can just shoot me a message directly in the chat. Thanks to those of you introducing yourselves. Um, so I'm just gonna set the stage a little bit with 
uh, an overview of our agenda. And I also want to share a poll um, that you should be seeing on your screens now. Um, just asking about kind of what best describes your county or organization's relationship with home-based providers um, right now. Do you feel like you're in a strong place, uh, kind of a place where you're improving, starting to have those connections, or really just kind of at the stage where you're developing those uh, relationships? Um, and if none of these really fit, feel free to share in the chat. I see someone doing that already. Um, so I'll leave this up for another second um, while I talk about what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to be focusing on how county leaders can support home-based child care providers, including family child care homes and also more informal family friend and neighbor care. Our speakers will be sharing strategies to improve the quality of home-based child care, increase access, and better support these providers and their unique needs. So I'm going to share the results now, just so folks have a sense. It looks like we have a pretty good spread of people kind of all over the board. Um, so excited to hear from you all in our discussion later, kind of more about what your situations look like. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie, who will be giving our first presentation. Um, Natalie Renew is the Executive Director of Homegrown, a national collaborative of funders committed to improving the quality of and access to home-based childcare. Homegrown is working to remove policy barriers, strengthen home-based childcare practices and business models, and support the growth and recognition of the sector so that all providers offer quality care and parents choose quality care. Prior to joining Homegrown, Natalie led the expansion of the Early Childhood Education Group at Public Health Management Corporation in Philadelphia. Um, and she has also overseen the development of large programs, secured funding for major initiatives, and supported local systems change in the early learning sector. Natalie, thank you so much for being with us today. And please go ahead and get started. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much um, to Arabella and Rashida and Nico for including me in this conversation and to all of you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is kind of share pretty high level, but um, Arabella will share the, the deck with you in follow up and there's a lot of links and additional reading in here if you want to go further uh, with some of the ideas that I share today. So uh, we can get started uh, on the next slide, please, uh, Arabella. So, you know, Homegrown is a funders collaborative. We are really committed to supporting um, home-based child care. And in part, the reason that we're so focused on the topic of home-based child care is because this is where lots and lots and lots of young children are having their early learning experiences. Um, lots of babies in particular, our youngest learners are in this setting. Um, and it's also where children and families um, who are often furthest from resources may be having their early childhood experiences. So our national data tells us that children from low-income families, children of color, children living in rural areas, and those with special needs and parents who work non-traditional hours are more likely to be served in the home-based care sector. And we also know that um, across the early learning landscape, while broadly we really don't have sufficient resources, we know very little attention, investigation, and very, very few resources reach the providers and families who are served in um, the home-based childcare setting. For homegrown, when we think about home-based childcare providers, we're thinking about this broad and inclusive sector that has both licensed family child care providers, small businesses, as well as this really diverse group of family, friend, and neighbor providers, some who are more professionalized, more uh, kind of on a path to being small businesses, and others who are grandmoms, neighbors, aunties, and family friends who are really stepping up to support families and who we see as just as critical um, to, the, to supporting families and being a part of the early learning sector. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about kind of what we've been seeing, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, you know, prior to COVID, things weren't great for home-based providers. We've seen sort of a over a decade trend around the decline of um, licensed family child care. And we have sort of been tracking now for, you know, a very long time, you know, that home-based providers are likely to be uh, living in poverty while working, you know, upwards of 55 hours a week. Um, and that 
sort of situation really got magnified during, you know, COVID. So especially initially we saw during COVID reliance on and dependence on home-based care really increased um, as centers and school closed. But we also saw significant hardship and challenges for this care sector related to health, related to family wellness and well-being. A lot of financial hardship as a result of changing enrollment, increasing costs and limited access to support. And we also saw providers really struggling to gain access to um, specific and, and appropriate information, um, you know, struggling to implement new protocols. And as bad as much of that was for licensed providers, those trends were even worse for family, friend, and neighbor providers, um, often who were explicitly excluded from federal, uh, state, and local support. Um, that being said, we can go to the next slide, please, Arabella. Um, this is such an incredible moment to be thinking about home-based providers and really um, considering how we can uh, do more to support them. So, you know, there's just this incredible moment as we reckon as a nation with, you know, um, issues around equity, recognizing that the children, families, and providers in home-based care are historically you know, have historically been marginalized from resources and support and the opportunity to sort of sense, bring them to be central to this conversation. As we see shifting workforce dynamics that really um, indicate how important home-based care will be to a thriving economy. And as we sort of consider these historic investments that have been made and that could be made in the future, there's just a real opportunity to do so much more here. So I'm gonna share a couple of strategies that we're thinking about. And then um, my friends um, at Families First are gonna you know, share how, how they're bringing some of those strategies to life. In particular, we've been really thinking about um, how government can more effectively interact with home-based providers and thinking about the role of networks, this kind of um, connective tissue that can connect government policy resources and information with broad groups of diverse home-based providers and have been thinking a lot about this concept of a network or an entity that's able to support providers in offering high quality care help them be financially sustainable and also create that connection between those children, families and providers and comprehensive supports like mental health, physical health, disability support. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is just sort of a visual image of what a network might look like. Again, with that blue um, kind of set of arrows being public resources, the orange, um, center is sort of the hub, and then that sort of bringing resources to providers and families, and then having providers and families really inform policy and system governance. So there's a lot of resources that we have available for communities that are interested in thinking about using um, public dollars to build that kind of infrastructure. I'm gonna just drop a couple of links in the chat if you all are interested to learn more about this. Um, and we also have some technical assistance um, if this is an area you'd like to get additional resources. What a network really offers to communities is kind of a leverage point to then deliver critical support. And um, we sort of see at the moment there are three really important ways that communities can be supporting home-based providers. Um, Arabella, if you don't mind going two slides ahead. Um, one of those opportunities is around leveraging networks of support and additional resources to build supply. Um, and there are lots of opportunities to do that by recognizing and supporting family, friend, and neighbor providers, sort of bringing them into the system and recognizing them and supporting them as a part of that system. One is supporting license exempt providers in seeking licensure and being able to serve, you know, a greater number of children and move into you know, quality and high stakes systems within your, um, your community. And another is to support, support small family childcare homes and becoming larger family childcare homes if that's appropriate within your uh, local licensing context um, where they can serve additional children, bring on some staff to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Today, we're gonna to think and talk a lot about like what it means to support quality improvement in families, uh, in the home-based childcare. And, you know, really 
at the heart of this work of building quality is recognizing that the modality, the how we reach and support uh, home-based providers needs to look significantly different than many of the other supports in the sector. And the what, the content and the curriculum um, also needs to look different to meet the needs of these providers who are most, uh, you know, to date are largely in a system that adapts center-based interventions for them in ways that may not be appropriate or comfortable. Um, we're going to hear about how local communities um, with shared culture and shared um, experiences can be critical facilitators of that. Um, and then really look at some of these leading strategies, including this opportunity to adapt home visiting as a way to reach and serve um, family, friend, and neighbor providers. But there are other really promising strategies um, that we are tracking as well. And then lastly, before I turn it over here, um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, we are thinking a lot about um, sort of how critical it is to ensure that home-based providers, both licensed and unlicensed, uh, and, and licensed exempt, are economically stable so that they can continue to show up for children and families. And so thinking about how we can expand and make subsidy systems more uh, inclusive and supportive of these providers, how we can expand access to, um, you know, additional uh, benefits for providers, um, and also thinking about these sort of not child care specific, but ancillary um, programs like the child and adult food program that can bring critical supports to children and families in this setting, recognizing that for children, families, and providers to thrive, that sort of stable um, economic uh, foundation is really important. So I touched on a lot of little, a lot of things there in a very short period of time. Um, in this slide deck, there is a resource page and all these orange, um, you know, uh, words on this slide deck are, are links if it's helpful for you to uh, go back and, and check some of them out. But right now, I am so excited to kind of turn over this presentation to um, uh, folks who I've had the pleasure of getting to know in Cabreras County. Um, and so I'm really excited to introduce uh, Spencer and Aurora Swain, who are the co-founders of Families First in Cabreras. Spencer leads the organization um, with his genuine concern for people, which you all will um, come to see in just a few seconds. Um, he's, uh, his, he has a commitment to protect the welfare and increase the quality of life for families and has over 12 years um, of experience working with young children and their families and is a parent himself. He has a Master in Divinity from the Erskine um, Theological Seminary and a BA in Business Administration from the University of South Carolina, as well as an Early Childhood administra Administrative Degree. Aurora supervises the programs at Families First and implements new programs and initiatives overseeing evaluation and model fidelity. She's a leading advocate for the Hispanic community in Cabreras County and has many certifications and many years of experience implementing evidence-based programs. She holds a bachelor's of science in systems and industrial engineering with a minor in marketing. I'm really thrilled to turn this presentation over to Spencer and Aurora. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, I am dropping in our county's vision statement. Um, I thought it, <clears throat> as you were talking, I thought about it and I searched it real quick and found it. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, so I'm going to just focus in on, on really our strengths, uh, which is what a lot of our programs do. We're a strength-based organization. Uh, and I just want to thank Arbella, um, the National Association of Counties, and, and also Natalie, such great information. Huge thanks to Cabrera's County. Um, the managers, commissioners, and their recent support um, of family home child cares and family friends and network to get at this struggle, advancing the health and education of all children. And we're specifically talking today about filling gaps for zero to three-year-old children. And yes, joining us is, uh, we have Carla Brown. She's our uh, child care task force team with the county. Um, so glad she could make it. And Aurora's with us. She is the co-founder and our director of operations, and it would we have to put this into context really by telling you a little bit more about her. She's the National Parent Educator of the Year in 2017. 
She is uh, home, had been, she's been doing home visiting for 16 years since we got married. Um, she's a recent appointed voting member by the General Assembly of a, what we call the Birth Through Third Interagency Council. And that council makes policies, legislation, recommends it to the General Assembly between the North Carolina DHHS and what Department of Public Instruction. So we get a lot of insight there from her. Yes, I graduated seminary. I'm a visionary. I'm a dreamer. She's an engineer. So welcome to our family. <laughs> I'll tell you more about our family in a minute. Um, our uh, area that we live in, uh, I see some fellow North Carolinians. Um, we're kind of a sibling of Charlotte, North Carolina. We're, we're in a growth spurt in, in our particular area, Cabarrus County, from 170,000 to 230,000 people in less than 10 years. It's 50,000, 60,000 more. It's a lot. Um, we also have 5,000 more children. Uh, as we all know, only a third of those accessing preschool that are under five years old, so 15,000 children. Um, Amazon and other folks are, are building these big centers in our rural area, um, and, and we have at least 3,500 or so of those are living under five years old in poverty. Um, we are a, a great county that loves our kids, but we only have 59% are, are performing at grade level by third grade. Our Hispanic population is right at about 13% and refugees are being added daily. Um, our ability to care, this is what I want to kind of share. Our abil ability at this point to care for children though is diminishing um, as our population is increasing. I think we have nine or 10 family home child cares left out of 40 in the last five to 10 years. Um, we've lost more than 25 center-based uh, child care centers in the last five to 10 years. A few years ago, we had 600 children on the wait list for vouchers. So they were a year or two out versus what I learned last week. We had nearly a hundred or more or less that are on the wait list that have vouchers, but nowhere to put children. And the huge gap in those services is children ages zero to three. Now, why is this happening? Um, I think uh, Natalie's provided a lot of resources to read into that. So I'm gonna tell you about our wins and what can be your wins, um, what might be your wins. And I look forward to hearing from you uh, about those too. So we founded Families First, it's about our agency. Um, we, we decided from day one to be working in the home with the whole family during that 1500 days before they get to kindergarten, during that 90% of brain development time period. And I'm just going to fast forward 6,000 home visits later. Um, we found ourselves opening three five-star immersion preschools and graduating hundreds and hundreds of children with the help of different subsidies and NC pre-Ks and other private pays and um, ESL classes, GED, citizenship, trauma-informed groups. Um, but home visiting is the heartbeat of everything that we do. That's how we find families isolated from the community and connect them. Um, and Aurora can maybe can share a little bit in a minute. Um, but found people, find people. And that's exactly how we've grown. Am I sure that we can begin to solve our childcare crisis here in our county? Well, we have to, and, and we will. Um, hundreds of low-income families uh, have gone through our home visiting program, through our preschools, and are thriving. Um, we, have, we, we know that. Um, they're in the elementary schools doing well. Um, am I more compelled and sure at this point that families and providers, home providers can do this? Absolutely, yes. Um, they just need our support. And uh, that's what I'm really here to talk about and how we're gonna do that. So we will continue our home visiting uh, of, with, through a Parent Child Plus core model. I call it our pipeline to preschool. Uh, it's for 18 to 36 month old children. We visit them twice weekly for 48 weeks. Um, with the goal of those children entering preschool ready to learn. So we just keep going upstream. Um, they're visited with, by specialists who uh, share the same language and culture. Um, during those visits uh, weekly, we bring a book or an educational toy. Um, they're able to keep that to build a permanent library. Um, with their emotional support, 
Um, we connect them to the resources in the community. And one, once they graduate, um, we ensure that they gain access to preschool. Um, and hopefully our preschools or any preschools, just making sure that, but they, but they enter ready for preschool. Um, now, has it always been the right time? You can probably change slides. Has it always been the right time uh, to begin uh, connecting providers and parents in terms of home-based care? Yes, it's always been the right time. Uh, but as Natalie noted, it's, it's, we have a moment to do this now. And it's important to note, I think, that being in homes, you're often first to learn immediately of the struggles. And when I say being in homes, I mean over 6,000 visits. You're first to learn intimately of, of the struggles. And because of eight years of being trusted, we're really lever leveraging all of those relationships. So first to expand and implement Parent Child Plus family home visiting model. And this is for licensed and for informal, um, thanks to a three-year Cabarrus County grant that we got. Um, and I'll share more about that in a minute. Um, so this model, family, imagine this model, it's the same as our Parent Child Plus home visiting model. It's the same as the core model. It has book equity, it's multicultural, they share the same language and culture. Um, but when we take a book that week, we're giving a book to the parent and the provider. So both are working at them at home, they're both working at them in their second home or their other home. Um, and I just love that about this program. Uh, we are, it's, it's all about child-led coaching twice weekly um, and just being a, a support system for the provider, family home child care providers. So um, more about that in a minute, but secondly, we're investing in parents and providers and using this model to establish a, a network I'll just tell you, um, I was so eager to get this done. Um, we just finished training last week or a couple weeks ago um, that I made my first visit to a family home child care probably uh, three or four months ago. Um, and I got there and she was in, in sort of a chaos mode. It was not really good, um, but I found myself three or four hours later there um, after three or four snacks and I cooked chicken nuggets that day. and. Um, she was in and off the phone and um, we laughed. The point is that we never spoke about Parent Child Plus. We never spoke about the three-year grant that we got. That's what I went there for. Um, the minute I went there to serve, think I was serving and offering, I, I was the one who got served, I guess is one way to put it. Um, and, but what really shocked me is when I was leaving, I asked her, I said, so, so now what? This was just such a, you know, it was a great day, but it was awesome. You had a really bad, bad situation go, going on. <clears throat> and she said, oh, Spencer, I have second shift now. And I just, I just left there um, in awe. Um, but a friendship was bo born. Um, I left there knowing that she had, you know, she really had no support. Um, she was... You know, these words we use, overlooked, underserved, I mean, this was true about her. And, and what I left there also thinking that, uh, I'm not getting preachy, but she was an orphan in the industry as a five-star family home child care center. She was truly an orphan, and she was serving orphans of the industry. You know, the children that Natalie's mentioned that, that, know, that centers don't want. So we're just beginning to leverage all these connections to establish this provider-led network and using uh, Parent Child Plus home visiting and Parent Child Plus family home child care visiting model. So it'll take a lot of work um, and a lot of partnerships. Um, you can probably move slides um, to make this happen. Uh, I was really stunned that day. Um, and so when I think about the key partners in this work, uh, I think about her saying, oh, Spencer, I had second so shift. And I realized that she is my first partner. Um, I knew it that day, but she, she calls me, she texts me, she folded me right into her family. And, and you know, we were the most unlikely of friends. Um, but when you go and you just are with someone um, over 26 weeks, visiting them twice weekly, you just build a relationship. So it's highly relational. Um, key partners are the providers without a doubt. Um, 
Now we have some grants from other municipalities that are in our Cabarrus County uh, region, uh, but it, the three-year grant from the county um, has really inspired myself and others. Um, it, it, it honestly feels like we're founding families first in a, in a, in a new way. Um, and I have mentioned that, that, that found people find people. So I feel like I'm finding this whole myself again, um, or this other arm that I knew that we would be serving one day. So we've uh, done a lot of strategic planning uh, in pre preparation for this. We've identified a lot of partners and stakeholders. And Natalie's right, um, they didn't, I think she mentioned in the slides, at least it did, um, they didn't get a lot of PPP money. Um, so we're establishing this network and somebody else can write this op-ed, but I think it's worth saying that we are creating a pipeline to preschool process. Um, and that's their PPP. I'm not smart enough to write it. Somebody can go write that. Um, so I do want to share our goals and then I'll be done. Um, they're pretty robust, uh, pretty bold, um, but thankful. You know, I'm so grateful to the county for, for taking this on with us and partnering with us um, to establish this network. It's highly relational, um, but our goals are to onboard 15 to 20 new self-sustaining childcare businesses in specific neighborhoods, to onboard onto the network 15 to 20 new self-sustaining childcare businesses so that they build and maintain this supply so we can get a hundred of those children off of the wait list who have a voucher, who have the assistance but nowhere to go. Um, we also are looking to have a platform, whether it's probably a, some sort of technology to create that pipeline to these preschools that no one seems to know about. Um, and the ones that have closed that are still serving children. Um, so our goals are, are really high, um, six to 10 over the next two or three years, six to 10 licensed, newly licensed or re-licensed will be in the family home child care visiting model, the parent child plus model. Six to 10 family friends and network or informal child cares will be in the parent child plus family home visiting model. Um, we hope that through this process, 20 or th to 30 new jobs will be created. Um, after three years, that four to 500 new, more children will be infused into kindergarten ready for a love of learning or infused into other preschools. Um, we hope to develop this pipeline, uh, resource guides, a sub pool with the local colleges, future funding advocacy work. And uh, it's really important for us, um, data collection and evaluation. And uh, the last thing I'll say really is before I should, close is to engage, 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 and support the businesses in our community. Um, so like the first visit, uh, this little boy, I'm going to close by sharing the story about this little boy who's telling me about his provider at, at that first visit. Um, he loved her so much, you could tell. He knew she was struggling that day. Uh, he, thought that, he thought that she had sent me for a purpose, to be with him. She, he had so much compassion. He was four years old and he knew that this was his home. This was his family. He knew that he had been there since birth. But I have to tell you that the first thing he said to me when I came in that day, he, said, he greeted me, he said, hi, my foster family drops me off here and this is my home too. So what an incredibly secure young four-year-old making sense of his world. And we owe it to the hero there, the, his provider and his parents and, or his foster parents. So let's help uh, home-based child care centers stay open. Let's help new ones get open and let, let us help them know they can make a living and mo make the most of it and know that they are the most important child care component for any community to thrive. Um, that's sort of our presentation um, and just kind of gonna open it up to questions. Uh, and I think the first one is, um, well, do you have any questions for me or Rorda? Um, Spencer, there's a question in the chat and maybe Sarah also wants to, Sarah Walder wants to jump in on this one. Um, asking a little bit about the measures that you use to assess kindergarten readiness um, of children in the home visiting or in the family child care home visiting. Um, 
program. I know that you all use a number of different measures, but wonder if you could share, uh, you or Aurora could share a little bit more about uh, how you uh, assess that kids are on track to enter kindergarten ready. So uh, Sarah may be the best to, to answer this one. Sarah, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, so I should differentiate in the in the one on one model or the core model where we're visiting directly with families. Um, most of our sites use uh, do the ASQ as part of their process of working with families. We also have a uh, two um, internal to the program measures. One that's a, a child behavior traits measure, which particularly looks at social emotional readiness and one that looks at parent child interaction. Um, in the home-based model, we have been using, uh, it has really varied from um, state to state, depending on whether the state has particular requirements for um, assessment on work with, with family child care providers. So bigger range there, although a lot of our providers are using, are doing the ASQ also, and particularly finding it a really valuable tool to do with parents as a way to talk about where the child is developmentally and make sure that they and the early learning specialist and the parents are, are all able to work together to support that child school readiness. Some of our other sites also are using a variety of measures to look at the care environment. So some sites use FECRS because that's what requ is required in their state. Um, some of our sites use the CCIS, the caregiver, child caregiver interaction skill. I knew there were two C's in it. Um, and, and then we also have multiple uh, research studies which have actually looked at whatever the kindergarten readiness measure is in that state. Um, and so lots of data on our website about that's really the key measure for seeing whether the children finishing the program are testing ready in their state um, as ready for kindergarten. So um, that, that would be the, the really the critical point that really tells you, right, if, if children are entering pre-K or kindergarten ready, depending on when the state administers those measures. And, and so for us, I would say we use the factors because that's, that's something we need to be using here in North Carolina, but uh, because we have the other immersion preschools and we use the uh, other formative assessments, um, we're able to take sort of that expertise and, or we will in, in this established network and offer that um, the observation tools that parent child plus family home child care uh, model offers um, is another way that um, we can insert these anecdotes and get these uh, get these formative assessments going. Um, Great any... question. Oh, yes, go ahead. Well, why don't we open it up a little bit? Um, I know we have some questions for all of you. Um, we'd love to kind of hear a bit more about what might be going on in your community um, and kind of open this conversation uh, a little bit more. So would anybody like to share uh, a bit more about your community and how you're thinking about supporting home-based providers or any strategies that you're currently using uh, to meet their needs? Kathy? So I, I am in upstate, way, way, way upstate New York, and we are doing a project that has been um, generously funded by our uh, counties to recruit new providers. It's a collaboration that we have with uh, community college. So we're recruiting new child care providers, giving them the the um, information that they need to get uh, through the New York State registration licensing process, and then um, connecting them with uh, small business advisors through our uh, Small Business Development Center to help them with you know, making a budget, creating a sustainable business. As Spencer mentioned, we want these businesses to, to work. Um, and then after they're open and they have children, then we're pushing in quality with um, a Jefferson Community College um, course, early childhood development, so that 
they're not trying to, I mean, we're, we're really building um, the network of, of providers. So last year was our test pilot uh, test, test year. Um, we opened eight new programs between the two counties. Um, we made some missteps. It was a little bit messy, um, but the counties have stuck with us and increased our funding a little bit. And we've got um, already 12 programs, um, 12 new programs in process for the second year. And um, we haven't kicked off yet. We, we are actually kicking off uh, March 8th. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. We had lost uh, 45 percent of our of our capacity for home based child care um, over the past probably nine years, just steady decline and then plummeting during during COVID. But um, we're trying to rebuild. We're hopeful. Wow. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Kathy. Kathy, would you mind sharing a little bit more about what the engagement with providers looks like, kind of more in the nuts and bolts? Like, is this online? Are there in person? How are you managing for, um, you know, issues like travel and access? So um, our area is is fairly rural. From from my office, which is, it, I can travel an hour and still be in my service area driving. Um, there's not. There's not a lot of traffic, but there's a lot of road. Um, so we're, I think the most important thing is actually working one-on-one -on -one with people. We're, we can do meetings, we can do um, you know, the applications and things like that. We, we can do trainings online, but we really need the hand over hand. It's building the relationships and, and you know, letting people know that we're there to help them looking at a particular situation that they have. Somebody said, oh, my house will never get, you know, it'll never be able to be approved because of this, this or this reason. And you get out there and say, you know, if you move that couch over there, if you move that window, I mean, just to kind of do some problem solving with them. Um, so recruiting, we, to recruit people into the program, we, we um, put out yard signs in some places. We did Facebook in some places. I mean, it's not, all of our area is not hooked up to high tech kind of things, but we did, um, you know, it, it's having, having your own business. Um, it's really hard. We, we're not lying to people, you know, saying this is a, a cushy way to make some money, but it's, it's a way to give you some control and let you make you know, an impact in your community. Um, I work for a child care resource and referral agency. And so we're really, we're really hand on with providers. We, we really, you know, they're, they're calling us for all kinds of things. We're calling them for things. Um, we like to have presents in our pockets when we go visit, you know, hey, we got a book, we got a, you know, a resource. Look, we have COVID tests. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to help. Awesome. That sounds amazing. And it definitely sounds like you've figured out some really strong strategies for reaching and recruiting providers. Would anybody else like to share a bit more about what's going on in your community or how you're um, reaching providers or ask more questions? Uh, hi, um, Natalie. I'm Carla and I'm the early childhood education coordinator for um, Cabarrus County. Uh, and so I am employed by Cabarrus County government. And um, we as a county have certainly looked at the, the early care and education and the early childhood systems of which these children birth through eight are a part of and um, what Spencer and Aurora are doing, they're doing is, is really, really exciting to me. Um, we as a, you know, county government understand that many neighborhoods within our county are considered childcare deserts. And there's, you know, very limited or no licensed childcare in the area. Um, so we also know that families need to return to the workforce or um, they're interested in going 
getting employed or seeking out employment, but the care, especially as Spencer said, infant and toddler care is just like as it is around the country, but is live a very low. Um, so we certainly see family child care um, and home based you know care providers as a value and val um, that part of the child care industry. Um, so one of the things is this grant opportunity and the innovative um, idea that uh, Families First had regarding this and how to support. And I think as Spencer and I have talked, we really want to empower these individuals to be able to come together, network and say, we are here, we are needed and we're professionals, just like our you know, counterparts that are in um, childcare centers. So what I'm thinking I'm really excited about is the, um, I think the empowering that they're going to get. They're gonna empower these individuals, create this network and these, they will be able to stand up and say, yes, we're, we're just as valuable. You need us, we, families need us. Some families prefer, I know when my daughter, and I've shared this with Spencer, my daughter who's now 27, but she was younger, she was not able to go into a center-based facility due to a medical um, uh, mm -hmm. situation. Our, our pediatrician said, if you put her into a larger setting, you will be in the emergency room every weekend. And um, at that time I was working with family child care home providers and I knew this amazing, amazing provider. And I asked her, you know, I'm, I'm waiting till you have an opening. I wish you had an opening. Put my child there, my child now, 27, can still tell you things about Miss Linda and how amazing she is. So I understand um, the need and I'm, I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited to even be on here to hear more in this homegrown. I wanna know more about that and the resources that are there. So I, I'm just really excited about all of this to, for people to be looking at a group that is often kind of shun or just looked at as babysitters and they're not and these are these are individuals who are probably honestly more apt to say i will provide care for those um zero to three year olds where others are saying no it's too cost too much you know whatever the thing may be so i'm really excited to be a part of this and to support spencer and aurora any way that i can um because i think i think what they're setting out to do and these goals that they have, they certainly will meet them and uh, it will be uh, really uh, a plus for our county. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carla, um, for sharing that um, and really for your leadership. I mean, I think it's really awesome to see um, county leaders investing in this kind of innovation and committing to support home-based providers. And it's also really lovely to hear your story because I think there are millions of parents around the country that are sort of thinking through those same decision points, right? And we know for many parents um, that, that this is what feels best to them and what they know is the best setting for their young children. So thank you for sharing that, Carla. You're welcome. Other questions or um, anybody else that'd like to share out? Oh, please, Spencer, jump in. I'm just curious out there, um, you know, you, you brought up the, uh, how valuable they are to the community, but how undervalued they feel. And I'm just curious about others out there, how they, are they experiencing that? And um, because I'm experiencing it more and more and more, obviously, um, and I'm just curious uh, about other folks out there uh, to move them into this provider-led network where they actually feel valuable um, and feel like they belong to this bigger thing that's occurring, um, caring for these children in the community. Um, right now, they just, again, I just feel, feel they're orphaned. I'm wondering to hear from anyone else out there. We have a, a lot of Hispanic families that we serve probably 50, 60% of our families 
Um, a lot of informal child care is out there. Um, these folks know how to do, how to take care of their children. And we add Parent Child Plus, these books and toys and coaching and mentoring into it. Into it. It'll be a wonderful thing. But, um, you know, our, our goal is for them to feel like they're such a valuable part of the community um, for what they do and the safety and the security that I mentioned that this little child had and the love and the nurturing and all those things that we know that a child needs before kindergarten, they do it so well. And not everyone thrives in that big, larger setting, you know, in the smaller settings. Um, this little child was so attached. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just curious if anyone else is, is in terms of the value of the, of the home child cares out there. Hey everyone, um, my name is Deb Tibbetts and I'm in Western North Carolina in a county called Transylvania. And um, yes, Spencer, we, we see the same thing. Our um, makeup is very similar to Kathy um, from upstate New York, very rural and a lot of um, multi-generational uh, care for um, young children is occurring. So what we've had to do is, um, very similar to some of the other folks, especially during the pandemic, is really start thinking about this in, a, in an innovative way. And we um, did get a grant to try to establish family child care homes. It was a very aggressive schedule over about nine months. And while we didn't yield a family child care home, we did a tremendous amount of foundational work. And an interesting thing is happening a couple of the folks that our early care capacity specialists um, established relationships with are coming back around now and saying that they may be ready. And, you know, like so many states, it's, it's a process to go through. And, um, you know, a lot of them, quite honestly, I think it was you, Spencer, who said, or somebody said in one of the presentations that um, smaller providers tend to live in poverty themselves, for example. And to your point, you know, may may not feel valued as a child care provider in the community. But we had a lot of the possible family child care home folks who were struggling to get their GED so that they could um, qualify. And so at any rate, we we probably met with and established contact with over 80 people. So we feel like that will be enough of a foundation that maybe a year from now we'll have some family child care homes. But the other interesting thing is towards the end of that grant, when we knew that we weren't going to use all the money um, for family child care homes, we went back to the funder and we worked with them to get an amount set aside that we could run a couple of family, friends, and neighbor pilots. So as our early care and capacity specialist started looking at our landscape, she thought that if she could structure a program with milestones and connect these FFM providers with family resource centers, for example, in our county or our um, county rec department or library who offer very robust um, programs in early childhood, get them out to um, meet with other parents and start networking. And as well, the socialization for the kids turned out to be a huge benefit. So that was all part of the milestones. So long story short, we've done, um, the first pilot was about 10 participants. Um, for FFNs. Now we've got a second uh, cohort going with about 20. And then the other interesting thing is as part of the outreach, um, we have a lot of faith-based organizations in our area. And um, a few of them are interested in offering up space to partner with a, a child care provider. So we've got a meeting next week with one of those and we're playing a role um, I'm sorry, I'm with Smart Start of Transylvania County and in North Carolina, Smart Start is our statewide system of early childhood. Um, I didn't really say that. So we serve as sort of a foundational backbone organization and partner with many organizations. So we are um, doing a meeting with this faith-based provider next week to kind of play that intermediary role and see if we can't get something going there because we think that this could be a great model to approach other faith-based organizations. So then lastly, I'm taking all of this and coming up with a comprehensive strategy and I'm gonna be looking for some funding um, to try to do something a little bit different here. So I just thought I'd share um, 
everything that's going on is quite inspirational and I'm um, really glad to have participated. Thanks. Thank you so much, Deb. I'm gonna follow up and learn more about that because it's so exciting to find um, partners around the country that are prioritizing uh, and supporting FFN uh, caregivers. So I'm gonna turn it back to Arabella because I think she has a few uh, concluding thoughts, but uh, really appreciate this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Um, and I just wanted to, Spencer or Aurora, did you wanna share any closing remarks before we wrap up? Uh, thanks everyone for being here. I, I know Aurora um, had to leave, um, so she's probably driving, but thank you. Great, well, thank you so much. Thank you both for joining and for speaking um, for your great presentations. Um, thank you all to those who joined and sharing the work that's happening in your counties. Um, there's so much great stuff happening in all of these very different, very disparate communities. Um, I'm just glad to have a chance for you all to get together and share kind of what you're seeing and experiencing. Um, and hopefully, you know, keep learning from each other and make all of our work stronger. Um, I also wanted to thank the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers, um, which is a project of the Pittsburgh Children's Initiative for their gracious support and partnership. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up email after this event with the slide deck, um, so you'll have access to all of those wonderful resources that Natalie shared. Um, we'll also share out the recording uh, probably today or next week, um, so you can reference it back. Feel free to share it out with your colleagues, um, anyone who couldn't join us today. Um, and as a reminder, we'd love for you to continue this conversation on the Counties for Kids virtual neighborhood. Um, I'll share out the link for that again and a more in-depth guide to using the neighborhood in the follow-up email as well. Um, so, you know, if you're someone who unmuted today and talked a little bit about your work and you have links that you want to share or stories, anything like that, um, would love for you to post those on the neighborhood so the folks who attended the other peer learning network sessions can learn from your expertise too. Um, you'll also receive a survey about today's convening that's posted in the chat now as well. Um, we'd really encourage you to just take a few minutes to complete that because um, your feedback really informs our future programming um, and helps us out. So we want to hear from you make sure that we're creating content that's useful for your work. Um, and then just one last note that we have our last um, Peer Learning Network session of this series on Monday at 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. It will be our urban one. So if you're joining from a small rural county today, it might be a little bit different, um, but we'll be hearing from King County, Washington about their work to offer comprehensive supports and benefits to family child care providers. Um, so even if, you know, Seattle is not necessarily a demographic and geographic match for where you're at, I think there'll be some really interesting information and discussion around that. Um, so I'll, I'll send out the link to that as well if you'd like to register. Um, but thank you all. Have a great rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you.